And welcome to this week's Artist on Art. I am your host, Nada Milkovich. I have the great pleasure of speaking with Helen Mayer Harrison and Newton Harrison, who uh, gave us a great honor and came into the KZSE studio today. Welcome to the show, Helen and Newton. Why, thank you. Thank you. I asked Helen and Newton to come up today because they're coming off of their amazing talk at this past TEDx Santa Cruz Radical Collaboration 2015, an event that just happened on Friday, April 24th, at the Rio Theater. It was a, a rousing success, and I'd say one of the, the biggest talks of that day was the talk that was given by Helen and Newton and moderated by the mistress of ceremonies, Irene Suprik. This uh, this was an opportunity that I have dreamed about, having worked with the Harrisons for many years. It was a great, great honor to be able to help get them on the stage to uh, give a, some very important information that needs to be uh, loud, loudly, loudly broadcast, and that is, what are we going to do about global warming? Helen and Mayor Harrison and Newton Harrison have been UCSC and UCSD art professors for many, many years. But before they started doing that, they were artists in their own right. And I believe in 1969, they made a vow that they would do no artwork that did not serve Mother Earth, Gaia, and have continued working in this way for over four decades, considered some of the champions and leading eco-artists in the world. It's such a great pleasure again to have you both on. Well, that's the second thing. <laughs> Don't make us do it again. <laughs> and so you all have been looking at, uh, what would you say, educating the, the, the world about what we're doing to Mother Nature as a part of your art practice. No. No. What have you been doing? We're actually trying to do something about it. Education's a side issue. I see. Um, education um, brings in lots of people, lots of money, but what do you do with the collapse of a million square kilometers? I don't want to educate people about that. I want to do something about that. And our work takes up those issues and explores what such a thing might cause. For instance, rehabbing a million square kilometers, say, on the Tibetan Plateau, or even more important, on the peninsula of Europe as the drought hits, a million square uh, kilometers, it costs a trillion dollars. We drop a trillion dollars on uh, 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 every six years on a war in this country. That's right. And when you're talking about dropping a trillion dollars, you're talking about dropping a trillion dollars over a 50 or 40 year time yeah, period. 30 to 50 years, we can't tell, but it's about uh, changing the nature of the landscape, changing the nature of what you do with the landscape, uh, doing deep, deep research in, say, paleo ecology, finding out what lived there when it was warmer, seeing if we can make use of that knowledge. Lots of stuff needs to be done. And so how, how could you give us a little explanation? Well, actually, you're doing this work right now in the Sierras You're as a part of the Sage Hen experiment. Is that correct? Correct. But to understand what we're doing, why don't you read the Helen's poem? You know, I'm about to bring that up. Um, Tell us what, what this poem is going to be. This poem sets out to, to redefine the laws of conservation of energy in ecological terms. At present, most of our production and most of our exploitation of the planet ignores the uh, um, how the uh, processes of entropy and thermodynamics and really the laws of conservation of energy work. And would you call this as the manifesto for the 21st century? It's the, okay, strangely as, as this sounds, we have to drop the entropy of the surface systems of the planet. We've exploited and become ingenious in our teaching of how to exploit all ecosystems. When you take energy from a system, you, you raise its disorder, you raise its uh, um, entropy, so to speak. And the question is, how does the system get such energy back to continue? In nature, for instance, 
Um, nature's all about exchange. Why does it grow when everything else shrinks? It grows because the sun is the engine, and nature sets up exchange. Every, everything it makes, something else uses, and, and this cycles and grows. What nature makes, we use, but we didn't bother to give it back. That's what uh, Helen's poem will be about. While I'm getting the technical difficulties of getting that poem up... Oh, oh that's oh. why we're holding it. <laughs> so the, the thrust of your work over the last 10 years has been how to meet this, this uh, chaos that we've introduced by lowering the entropy, by extraction, by our, our consumer practices. Correct. And... and uh, um how do you say this? You know, the best way to understand this is the way f physics, physics talks about it in first-year classes. You stick a glass of hot water in a cold room. Well, now, after a couple hours or less, the water and the room are at the same temperature. The glass of water has lost its heat energy. The room has gained that heat energy. The temperature in the room has raised... Oh, a hundredth of a degree, a little bit. So there's no loss of energy, except what was what was working in the glass doesn't work anymore, and the glass can't get back. The, the Cut the trees in a watershed and make the same metaphor. So go ahead and and follow out that metaphor for us. If you're cutting the trees, okay. If you cut the trees out of a watershed, you've uh, the sun hits the earth, erosion happens, the loss of. Uh, a species in the soil that helped trees germinate goes away, particularly in the Pacific Coast rainforest, the Sitka spruce being an example. And um, what happens is the watershed loses its ability to, to uh, keep its energy intact. So what happens? It continues, things continue to live, but it simplifies itself. And so there's a loss of genetic material as well. Yes, and and I can't get it back. So how can we help it get it back? That's um, um, what, what Helen calls collaboration with nature. You have to collaborate. You can't bioengineer. And we don't know enough, and, and probably never will. It took four billion years to get here. And we think in a, in a hundred years of research, we're going to match four billion years of, of, of nature's exploration and, and experimentation. Not likely. Sorry, John Wayne. <laughs> Helen, would you mind telling us a little bit on your thoughts on the the way we could perhaps activate people to move, to make changes? Well, first of all, I think that <clears throat> We're going to have to really uh, get people involved. And how do we do that? It's a very difficult thing to do, but it's more important than anything else we can do. And that's why we're artists. We can present the images that will move people. They won't... They will see them. It will energize them. They will see it and they will think about it and they will carry it with them and may go on to work with them and do the kinds of things and explore what needs to be done. Whereas if we just give them the information, they'll say, oh, how terrible. And gee, we ought to do something. Maybe what can we do? And that drifts off so that in order to get people involved in working with you, you have to get them feeling that it is necessary to so do. And you can do it in music, you can do it in art, you can do it in uh, in face-to-face -to -face talk, you can do it in all kinds of ways. But it has to be something that is meaningful to them. And then from there on, good luck. <laughs> can, we, uh, can we put a word like empathy on what you're describing? Empathy is uh, very much, uh, it's feeling. But empathy means that you're really feeling 
what is going on. Sympathy, for example, uh, you are sympathetic when you see that a mother has uh, it, uh, has to run after her child, and it may, you're sympathetic with the mother. But empathy is when you are or, the other. But not completely the other. Where you feel the like the other. When it's you, not that you are, but you feel like the other. It's more than feeling. You identify in some way that you are that. Um, it's like you are the deer you killed, and so you have a certain sorrow that you're ending a life to serve your own. Yes. And that that's so different from sympathy. But the the issue here is we've got seven billion people. And it's real hard to to um, change seven billion minds, mind by mind. Right, right. And would you say that there is a real need to have empathy for nature? Well, every preliterate culture did. We didn't because it didn't pay off in the short term. Of course, in the long term, we're screwed. Okay, Sorry, you shouldn't say that. Explain yeah. that to us. It's it's okay. It's not one of the bed. <laughs> it's okay. I don't have to take it back. You're not going to blip it out. No, not like when you told us about how you made soil in the museum, but we won't go there. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, look, every constitution, every government, every teaching institution more or less teaches people how to exploit the environment for their for their uh, well-being um, you have dictatorships do it um, socialist governments do it even good nice perfect Denmark does it so uh, what needs to be done is so vast the change so profound that we suspect that nature ultimately is going to play a big role in being our teacher, not us getting up and saying things. And nature becomes a teacher when nature becomes, system by system, minimally productive. Except some systems, like like viral development, they become very productive. And so um, we can look forward to terrible viral infections as temperatures rise. We can look forward to ecosystems fading back. We can look forward to the ocean becoming minimally productive where food's concerned. And the ocean's not sucking much carbon in. So uh, the carbon CO2 is rising up. And we can look forward to all these problems, all of which will stress the ability to live it all and all of these things all together set up the conditions for what everyone else is calling mass extinction. I'm merely calling it a gigantic ecological correction. Okay? You also call this the force majeure. What's that? You also call it the force majeure. That's the event that's happening. The force majeure is something um, we found a name for a while ago when we were, looked at all our work, and there was always something missing. And however much we helped Holland or some other country or some other place or a river or the cleaning of the estuary at, 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 in the Black Sea by accident, all the stuff we did was only a patch. The world has an infinity of patches but a finite number of systems, and those systems are under stress. And the stress they are under we call the force majeure. It is the combined raising of temperatures with... Uh, exploitation of almost all systems and we call it the force majeure because it can be understood also as two extremely forceful almost inevitable wave fronts one is a wave front of heat moving across all, all touching everything and the other is a wave front of water raising the oceans and touching and raising against all landforms so I mentioned at the top of this program that you two are here at UCSC, you have a center here called the Center for the Study of the Force Majeure. Yes. Um, uh, the Metabolic Studio has funded it a bit, uh, importantly, and um, uh, smaller donors have. We're in, we're in bad need of 
funding. We actually need approximately a $20 million endowment uh, to do the kind of research needed to uh, set up other centers in major universities for study. We actually need to think a whole new discipline needs to be made called large systems entropy analysis. All these things become possible if if we're given the funds to generate them. If we're not, so be it. But we are beginning to do it. We have no funds now that may... Uh, we have people who are working with us in China. And that is going to be a very interesting way to work because China is one of the few countries in the world that have a view of the planet or a view of their area and in some way that is significant. China can legislate stuff and move in a way more quickly than others. Because they're not capitalistic. Yes. Yes. Or they're semi-capitalistic. Yeah. So That doesn't make them perfect. It simply makes them more able to respond. Right. Can I say what we're doing? Yeah, I was going to ask you. So give us some... Okay, we're working with a... uh, brilliant, uh, um, oh, I guess you'd call him an ecologist, but he's a general uh, systems understander, a guy named uh, Tang Ya, runs an institu- a couple of institutes there. And w- we've just been funded to do our first project in Tibet, which is to invent an ecosystem, understory and over a proto-ecosystem, like 40 or 30 or 40 species, plant them in front of a glacier, and so that a, 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 a plant ensemble, a proto-ecosystem, will follow a glacier uphill. If it does so, it holds water in the ground, begins regenerating topsoil, and it it uh, um, begins the hard work of re- regenerating top, uh, surface soil. But holding water in the ground is imperative, and eliminating erosion is imperative. And if we do it there, it can be done... Uh, with many, many glaciers all over the world. A, so, se- a second thing we're starting with him is posing the question of, of designing an eco-security system not different than a social security system. Which we need here in the United States. Forget it. Let me, let me just go back to the glaciers. They want to dismantle our social security system. <laughs> right. <laughs> Who needs the environment? So the... the the way you're, what you're gonna, what you're planning on doing in Tibet, which is something similar that you're doing here in the Sierras, in the Sage Han, yes. in the Sage Han, is that you are creating this prototypical ecosystem that will follow the glacier as it's melting and moving up the mountain. Right. So that no time is lost. No, uh, the nature will produce uh, work. Nature will do this over a couple hundred to a thousand yes, years. Yes. And, yeah. and so what happens as a glacier melts? What are you left with? You're left with uh, either rock, if it's a steep slope, or you're left with sort of stony subsoil. But this stony subsoil stuff is adapted to grow in if you select correctly, and it self-complicates over years. You can find this out when you look at a line across Europe, where the glaciers stop... The ecosystems to the other side are complex. Where the glaciers move back, the ecosystems move in, and after 12,000 years, they're only about 70 to 80 percent as complex. So nature is who you have to learn from. Nature knows how to respond to catastrophe, even to die off. And if, and if nothing is done, basically we lose the topsoil, we lose the water, the water will be yes. gone with drought and flood, Yes, and therefore, like the Sage Hen piece says, can we invent a species ensembles that will move in quickly? We'll have the seed stock. They can move in quickly and reduce the um, impact of die-off in the high ground in the Sierras. As temperature rises 10 degrees, gl- uh, glaciers go away, ice pack goes away, rain becomes intermittent and heavy. And rivers experience flood and drought. Can we mediate that? Our sage hen ex- experiment, there's 12,000 plants in the ground right now. We're testing it. We have a small team of scientists working on it. Um, and again, thank you, Metabolic Studio. 
Tell us more about the work of the Center for the Study of the Force Majeure. How do you envision this going after you've gotten the $12, $20 million? Well, you cut it in half. We need 40 But okay, 20 will do it. Um, who knows, you know? Um, look, what, what happens is the, we can then people it. Right now, it's pretty much volunteer. Uh, we all the money that comes since Helen and I are already paid by the university. The the uh, all our work is volunteer. Uh, all the people who work for us, with the one exception of our manager, who's working very cheaply, um, um, is volunteer. We need to build a powerful office. We need to get to the Max Planck Institute in Germany and see if they'll open a center. We'd like to fund that. We need to get to Stanford and see if it'll fund it. We think we need to get to a South American university and uh, um, among other places. So you need you need to spread these ideas. But above all, you need to raise the visibility of what en what entropy analysis can do for you in restoring energy to depleted systems. Recharging the planet from what human destruction and extraction has done. That yes. sounds like a get better scheme. Just helping it along so it's not as bad as it's likely to become. You can't really undo this stuff. You can help it along a lot. And one of the things that becomes very important there is collaboration. We, In order to have this system really work, we must be not just one country but doing it in their particular area, but countries doing it and working together so that the world is covered with people who are doing and also, who are people going. assume, you know, like, people assume co collaboration with each other. Really, we have to be collaborating with nature, okay? Um, all, like social justice. All social justice stuff is about helping people, helping people, most of it. We've got to toss so much more energy into collaboration. To helping people help the planet. That is what people don't understand. Enough. Well, people get it. They just don't know how. Yes. I got, I got the poem up for the force majeure. Is that that's where we want to end today? Okay. Uh, yes. Is that good? Yes. I can't thank you enough. Helen Mayer Harrison, Newton Harrison, our dear audience, if you heard this and have been moved, please go see their work at the Harrison Studio dot com. Is that right? Yeah, the and then net, you, the net, the, that's our net net piece. Yeah, that's the that's the whole oeuvre of your work, yeah. which is f over four decades worth of work. And then there's also the Center for the Force Majeure that you can go to and find online. Um, Helen Mayer Harrison, Newton Harrison, thank you so much for taking your time to come here today. Uh, hot off of your TEDx Santa Cruz triumph. Um, it's been wonderful.